So I'm going to talk about the ups and downs of MRI. We've been doing it for many, many, many years, and I think we have uh, you know, an increasing grasp of both its strengths and its limitations as well. So uh, first question, modern multiparametric MRI consists of which of the following sequences? Diffusion-weighted imaging, T2-weighted imaging, perfusion-weighted imaging, or all of the above? So everybody got that right. I'm just trying to set the stage to make sure everybody's on the same wavelength. Uh, let's see, next slide. Uh, the next question is, PIRAD score is based on the following elements, lesion size, suspicion of extra caps or extension, seminal vesicle invasion, or lymph node size? Which of those is included in the PIRAD score? Very good. So, so people, people got that really the only one of these uh, features that really yields a PIRAD score is lesion size. The others are the diffusion-weighted imaging, perfusion-weighted imaging, and the T2-weighted image, uh, but none of the others. So, uh, and that's important to know when really thinking about what are some of the limitations of MRI. If you use PIRAD as really the only thing you're looking at on an MRI, you're gonna be missing some information from an MRI uh, that could be potentially of importance. So my disclosures, go back through those. Okay, so MRI is, uh, as you know, has many, many uses, and I think the list has uh, increased. We, we got into this 15 years ago because we wanted to uh, plan our surgeries better. Uh, there was an article from Memorial Sloan Kettering suggesting that the use of MRI prior to surgery could actually improve uh, a surgeon's decision-making in terms of nerve sparing and whatnot, and so we got into it about the time that the robot came about as a way to see what was going on when we could no longer really feel what was going on, which was, of course, one of the earliest critiques of robotic surgery. And then later on, uh, when Lenny Marks joined our group in 2009, uh, he started to use this for, uh, diag for diagnosis, particularly with ultrasound MRI fusion biopsy. Uh, a big group at UCLA is also doing in-bore MRI biopsy, predominantly done by the radiologists. Uh, as time got, has gone on, MRI has been uh, increasingly recognized to be useful for management decisions, particularly active surveillance versus therapy, as Lori alluded to this morning. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, the question is whether MRI is useful for either surgical guidance or particularly for planning of focal therapy, which Nelson touched upon and which I'll expand upon a little bit more in this talk. So MRI for prognosis, detection of cancer, and prediction of final pathology. So the PIRAD score, one of the, I think, really strengths of MRI is it's not just providing anatomical information, it's providing functional biological information. And this is a, paper, this is a study that we uh, just submitted uh, for publication, but basically we took a large group of men with Gleason grade three plus four in any kind of biopsy, whether it was systematic, transperineal, or, or a targeted biopsy, and we simply asked whether the PIRAD score of the suspicious lesion on MRI could actually predict uh, or prognosticate for biochemical recurrence. And as you can see here, uh, there was actually a very strong correlation between the PIRAD score itself in all patients with Gleason 3 plus 4 in biopsy and ultimately biochemical recurrence with PIRAD 5, of course, being associated with the highest risk of recurrence over time. Uh, this is a paper that we just published recently, again, looking at a large collection, over 300 cases, where we had the MRI as well as the whole mount uh, prostatectomy specimens. Uh, and, and what we looked at is what are the predictors of biochemical recurrence with a focus on looking at uh, the PIRAD score as well as the tumor volume predicted by the MRI, even if that tumor volume may not predict the ultimate uh, tumor volume on whole mount, whether just the MRI a region of interest tumor volume could predict biochemical recurrence, and indeed, by univariate analysis, tumor volume could predict recurrence. The overall PIRAD scores I just showed could predict recurrence, as well as the usual things, pathologic stage grade, positive surgical margins. And when we looked at a multivariate analysis, the, the one determinant of a recurrence from an MRI was actually not PIRAD score in this analysis, but MRI tumor volume as being the strongest independent predictor of, of recurrence. And that's probably because PIRADS already correlates with Gleason score, so it's accounted for in the pathologic uh, Gleason score to some extent. Uh, 
more information you can get from MRI other than pi rad scores, you can actually, there are predictors of extra capsular extension that you can get. And this is work from Peter Pinto's group at NCI where they looked at both the uh, MRI suspicion score, this is really predates uh, pi rad, but they also looked at things such as the contact length between the tumor and the capsule. So the longer the, the capsular uh, contact, uh, the tumor uh, contact the capsule, the question is could that predict extra capsular extension? And his group showed that the tumor capsule contact length was actually a strong prediction, uh, predictor of both extra capsular extension as well as biochemical recurrence. So the point is that uh, the MRI really uh, does not, the PIRAD score only accounts for diffusion, T2, et cetera. It includes volume to some extent because the difference between PIRAD 4 and 5 is a, tumor, is a lesion that's less than 1.5 centimeters or greater than 1.5 centimeters, but it doesn't really include any statement in the PIRAD score about extra caps or extension or biochemical recurrence per se, and so you need to take into account the actual tumor volume on the MRI as well as tumor capsule contact length, and uh, there will be a, other radiomic features that will emerge over the few uh, next coming years, which will actually improve upon the current PIRAT score. So uh, you heard a little bit about MRI ultrasound fusion for targeted biopsy. We've been doing this now for about nine years. Uh, there are a number of devices that can be used. You heard a little bit about this from Lori. This is the Artemis device. We also use Uranav, but there are many platforms. And those platforms can be used both for tr uh, transrectal, uh, but also for transperineal. So you can certainly apply this MRI fusion to a transperineal uh, platform, which is increasingly used in Europe. Uh, and in places with high, ri high rates of infection after transrectal biopsy. Next slide. All right, so this is some early data that really looked at the first 1,000 transrectal ultrasound fusion biopsies that were performed at UCLA. And the key point here is that if you just look at the targeted biopsy alone, the great thing about MRI is that you reduce the detection of Gleason 6 cancers uh, but you maintain or even increase the risk of finding a Gleason 7 or a Gleason 8 cancer. But we continue to believe that a systematic or mapping biopsy, basically it's a pre-planned systematic biopsy by the machine, uh, can actually improve the detection of higher risk cancers. And so if you look at the total detection rate for Gleason 7, you, combining systematic plus, uh, plus the targeted, uh, you get an additional 60 cases of Gleason 7 and 15 cases, which implies that just a targeted biopsy alone uh, will miss about 20% of cancers, which is in line with what I'll show you a little bit later, which is that o the overall detection rate of cancer, uh, significant cancers by MRI is about 80%. So we still continue to believe that there's a role for systematic biopsy, but like anything, it has advantages and disadvantages. The advantage is you, you're going to find all of the cancers that are probably present. The disadvantage, like a, uh, a, the 3D biopsy we just heard about, is you're going to find all the Gleason 6 cancers as well. Uh, so, so you need to take the, the good with the bad in terms of deciding what to do. Uh, we looked at what's the concordance rate between a targeted biopsy or a combined systematic plus targeted biopsy and the final radical prostatectomy specimen. As you know, if you just use transrectal ultrasound biopsy, uh, you undergrade cancers about 30 to 40 percent of the time. If you use a targeted biopsy approach, however, you'll only underestimate, uh, you'll on, only undergrade about 20% of the time, 18%. But again, the best results, at least in our hands, were a combination of systematic and, uh, and targeted biopsy to yield uh, the optimal score. Uh, you heard a little bit this morning about the negative predictive value of, uh, of MRI for identifying men who uh, might be appropriate candidates for active surveillance. Uh, and this is one of the papers that uh, Lori had on his table that we published a number of years ago, uh, looking at really the ability of MRI to aid the traditional Epstein criteria for prediction of truly low-risk cancer. And in our hands, if you combined MRI together uh, with Epstein criteria, you really you only missed one case of a, of a quote-unquote aggressive cancer. Uh, so certainly the absence of a visible lesion on MRI together with traditional uh, uh, clinical parameters of a low-risk cancer do improve the identification of tumors that are low-grade and could be surveilled. 
So how about the accuracy of multiparametric MRI for prediction of final pathology? So really, how good is MRI when you really look at the interrogate the entire gland itself by radical prostatectomy and you compare it to what the MRI actually uh, uh, showed? And there's been a lot of controversy about this because there have been a number of studies, uh, for instance, those from Mark Emberton's group in, in London that have essentially said that the, uh, that the sensitivity of MRI for detection of prostate significant prostate cancer is 90, even as high as 95%, uh, whereas others have reported, such, uh, like ourselves, that it's about 80%. And I think part of the discrepancy has to do with, number one, what we're comparing the MRI to. No, we're not comparing it to biopsy results. We're comparing it to a radical prostatectomy. Uh, the other is what is called a positive MRI. So in Emberton's study, which you're probably familiar with, they got an MRI first, then they did a transperineal uh, template-guided biopsy, and then said if the MRI was positive and there was a cancer, that was counted as being the, the positive identification by the MRI of a cancer, even if that cancer was maybe not located the, in the same location as the MRI suspicious lesion. So there are some technical issues with uh, some of the papers that could account for some of the discrepancy. Uh, but this, Nelson showed uh, a little bit of this uh, paper that we published a few years ago looking at 122 cases where we did an MRI prior to radical prostatectomy and then uh, essentially looked at the whole mounts and correlated each, le at each pathological lesion with the same uh, areas on the MRI. And what we found overall is if you look, depending on how you look at things, if you look at the index tumor that is the largest tumor of higher grade, highest grade, MRI was able to detect 80% of those. But if you look at all tumors, that is uh, non-index plus index, uh, MRI missed about 50% of those. So among the non-index tumors, MRI missed about 80% and detected 80% of the index tumors. Now, part of that is owing to uh, the ability of MRI to identify tumors of certain sizes. So if a tumor is less than uh, half a centimeter in maximum tumor diameter, MRI really does a very poor job, only can detect about 10% of tumors that are that small. And as uh, Nelson showed, if a tumor is less than one centimeter, MRI misses about 75% of those tumors. So it's not really until you cross the threshold of one centimeter that the sensitivity of MRI for detecting cancers increases, which is probably why the, there's a correlation between tumor volume on MRI and biochemical recurrence as well. Um, and then importantly, Gleason 6 tumors, and this is probably a good thing, are, are rarely detectable unless they're very large, whereas Gleason 7 and higher tumors are detectable about 80% of the time. Uh, and then this is a similar study that we uh, reported just this past year uh, where we looked at a different, uh, a basically a subsequent group of patients where we actually used uh, molds so that we could really, really match the MRI, the actual section of the MRI to the section of the prostate on whole mount. We found basically the same thing. We, we found that the sensitivity of MRI for detection of the index cancer was 80%. For clinically significant cancer, 76%, and for all cancers, 53%. So really, the, the, the same thing that we had shown in the publication uh, that Jesse Lee uh, wrote up in 2014. Uh, and you heard a little bit about cribriform cancer this morning, and, and it's interesting. So the, there, there are clearly histologic variants of prostate cancer, which for whatever reason, not totally understood, are not visible with our current day MRI. And this is a paper from the Rochester group showing that cribriform prostate cancers are very, very poorly detected uh, with uh, MRI, but cribriform cancers, uh, as the Toronto group has shown, are actually quite aggressive biologically. So this is certainly one class that, regardless of tumor size, is oftentimes missed by MRI and I think it's important to be aware of it as a limitation. Uh, and this is what I was talking about before when I was talking about the Emberton study. In the Emberton study, if there was a lesion of interest such as here, and then the patient had a positive biopsy, that was, that was called a, uh, a hit, basically, positive identification of a tumor with MRI. But when we do whole, map, uh, whole mount mapping studies, what we can show is sometimes you'll see a region of interest here, but the tumor is actually located elsewhere. And it may actually be true that the presence of a region of interest on the prostate, in the prostate, is associated with the presence of cancer elsewhere, uh, secondary to field effects or, or unknown, uh, but that needs to be elucidated further. Uh, more commonly, what we see is, is something like this, where we have a region of interest located here, 
but then the whole mount shows a tumor that's obviously in this spot, so this would be considered a positive detection of, of a cancer, but obviously this cancer is much larger and is typical of particularly aggressive cancers. Uh, they could be pedunculated and aberrantly shaped. They're not nice round tumors, uh, nice circles that you can easily ablate. And so if you try to ablate this tumor based on the MRI, uh, without this uh, uh, template mapping biopsy or some study uh, such as that that we've heard about, you would obviously miss most of the tumor. And so this is something that years and years of, of working with the radiologists and the pathologists on a weekly basis at a conference I saw time and time again. So based on that, we decided to really interrogate this further, and we did this together with uh, Lenny Marks's group and, and Alan Priester, one of our engineers who works with us. And they came up with a way to use the MRI to create a 3D mold of the prostate uh, so that we could be sure that the sections of the prostate by whole mount were essentially in the same orientation as the sections of the MRI. Uh, and then essentially we mapped these all out, measuring the tumor uh, diameters as well as the tumor volumes, and then comparing the region of interest on MRI to the final whole mount radical prostatectomy specimen. Uh, and this is how it looks in action. Uh, and we do this routinely really on all of our cases uh, over the last number of years. And so what we did here, for instance, this is a tumor on whole mouth. This is a region of interest that was marked by the radiologist using both T2 weighted as well as diffusion weighted imaging. And then we mapped essentially uh, the, 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 both the maximum tumor diameters as well as the tumor volumes and compared them to each other. And as Nelson showed you uh, just a little bit ago, what we found, which is what we expected, was that there is a significant mismatch between tumor volume uh, on a radical prostatectomy and the region of interest predicted tumor volume on an MRI. So if you look, and this, in, importantly, this increased as the Gleason score increased. So for that, for higher risk cancers, there was actually a greater discrepancy in the predicted size of a tumor compared to the region of interest compared to actually lower grade tumors. And this held true whether it was tumor volume or maximum tumor diameter. And we uh, measured what's called the Hausdorff uh, maximum, which is essentially the maximum, the greatest distance between the matched tumor uh, and the region of interest, which averaged 15 millimeters. So one and a half centimeters average discrepancy between the maximum tumor diameter on the region of interest and in the prostate. And this shows that, that the, the mismatch occurs in, in multiple orientations, but particularly in the base to apex. So if you're doing transperineal mapping, it's particularly critical to look at uh, basically head to toe or caudal to, uh, to uh, proximal uh, in terms of measuring where that tumor is, perhaps even more important than measuring kind of lateral differences. Uh, but you can see that you, it's very unpredictable in terms of uh, how different it is. You have some really huge outliers, uh, but very few uh, fall on a curve of a perfect match. Uh, and as he showed this graph as well, which estimated that if you were going to do focal therapy and you were going to do what many people are doing and proposing, which is a 14 millimeter uh, rim or boundary around the region of interest, that you would miss uh, treating 50% of those tumors. And that to encapsulate 100% of all tumors, you'd have to have a four centimeter margin, which of course is bigger than the prostate itself. So a 59 year old gentleman has a truss biopsy that shows two cores of Gleason 6 disease on the right. An MRI was obtained two months later and shows a PIRAD5 lesion in the right peripheral zone. What would you do? Do a targeted biopsy, recommend active surveillance, recommend immediate treatment, A or C, B or C. Um, so do a targeted biopsy was the, was the uh, top answer. Uh, I, would, I would have said, honestly, I would have said A or C, because as I showed you, a PIRAD5 lesion in the prostate is strongly prognostic for biochemical, uh, biochemical recurrence and a Gleason 7 or higher disease. So if I see a PIRAD5 lesion uh, in somebody with, let's say, a PSA density of 0.16, something like that, uh, I might not do a repeat biopsy on that patient. I might take them immediately to surgery or radiation, whatever. But doing a, obviously doing a, re, a repeat targeted biopsy is not the wrong thing to do.